And we have covered a lot of different uh, studies over the years, a lot of different topics and a lot of different books and, and even uh, some biographical things. But um, you may not remember them all. That's okay. That's okay. There was benefit in all of them. It's like the man who was leaving church one time and he, he said to his pastor, you know, I've forgotten most of your sermons. <laughs> The pastor said, well, let me ask you this. How many, um, how many meals have you eaten that you have forgotten? Do you even <laughs> remember what you ate last night? The man said, no. The pastor said, every one of them has been nourishing in some way, right? right. You, you don't remember them all, but they were meaningful and they were needed at the time. And you don't have to remember everything that we read and that we say in church, but, but God is meeting a need each time, each time we meet together and we open his word. We know that his word does not return empty or return void if you are raised on the King James. We know that it is good. It is good for you. And even when we read parts that we've read before, we get to know the Lord better. So I was uh, visiting with my parents um, the days after Christmas, spent, uh, spent three days with my parents and uh, my dad's doing uh, pretty well, you know, with his Parkinson's and all. He's had it since 2019, but still, Still doing okay. Didn't see any further deterioration this time. But, uh, you know, we're sitting at the table with, uh, with my kids, his grandkids, and I asked him, um, if you grew up in Nebraska and you graduated from a small college in Nebraska, how in the world did you get to Dallas, Texas, where you met my mother? And he said, well, I started working for an insurance company and I was doing underwriting, and they said, um, Pete, you've got, to, you've got three options. We're going to move you. We're going to move you to, uh, to San Francisco, to Dallas, or to New York. Which one do you want? And he said, well, I guess I'll take Dallas, because he didn't want the other places. And so he was transferred by his company, and that's why he settled there, and then eventually got a job with the airlines and, and met my mother, who was a flight attendant. I, I didn't know how he had gotten to Dallas. I've known my dad. Hold on for 49 years, because that's how long I've been alive. I didn't know that, I didn't know that about him. If I can know a man for 49 years and not hear that story until now, there are things that we can always be learning about the Lord, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, Yeah. you're never done. Right, you'll say, oh my goodness, this is something I never thought of. There it is. Yeah, and you want to tell everybody. Yes, yes. yes. Or maybe you thought of it again for the first time. I could be too. Maybe, maybe. There's always, always something to glean and effort that is needed to be put into the relationship as there is with any relationship. My relationship with my father and asking him questions about things that he may not just naturally volunteer. And of course, as we commune with God and we pray and we learn and we are open to what God has to say. So my plan my plan for uh, the next few weeks, I hope that you have a plan for your relationship with God this year. I, I hope you've made some New Year's resolutions and at least one of them includes something spiritual. I hope that you're still intentional and you're making an effort in your relationship with the Lord. I know it's this time of year, a lot of people decide they're gonna tackle a one year Bible reading plan. You know, we offered that a, a few years ago and more than 30 people you know, went through it together. Um, I'm not doing a one-year plan this year. I'm in the middle of my own plan. Uh, every day I read either two chapters from the Old Testament or one from the Old and one from the New. I alternate, and that way I will get through the Bible in about a year and a half. Okay, a little bit longer, but that just keeps me um, interested in what I'm reading instead of trying to plow straight through. But I hope that you have a plan or something regarding uh, your Bible reading or devotional reading or, or prayer. Something. Something that you have uh, nailed down here on this, uh, what is this, the third already? January 3rd? Yeah, yeah. Some kind of creative Bible study or, or being more involved perhaps than you have been in the past. Here, what I'd like to do is, um, is go back to Genesis and talk about the men who built Israel. The men who built Israel. There was a, a mini series on the History Channel um, a few years ago called The Men Who Built America. And it focused on uh, Rockefeller and Carnegie and some of these other men, you know, who, who made it great. But uh, I want to take 10 or 12 weeks to look at the, the patriarchs, the men who built Israel. I'm talking about um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes, 
and run through their lives together fairly quickly and hopefully we'll learn and we'll glean some things from them. And there are going to be places where it intersects with our, our Sunday series. So this is kind of a, a soft start, an introduction to where we're going to be uh, next week and, um, and hopefully we'll have some of those who are sick or out to join us for this series. Okay, you've got your yellow sheet and it's got lots of questions on it. Let's, um, let's look at a few different places in the Bible as we do some background study. Uh, first of all, Genesis chapter 12 and verses 1 through 3. We're going to start in Genesis 12 and then work backwards, okay? Genesis 12, first three verses. You've got your Bible open, yes? yes? Right. The Lord had said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Goodness. What promises did God make to Abram here? There is more than one. What promises did God make to Abram? He was going to show him where he wanted him to go. He was going to show him where he wants him to go. Yes. So he already has a place in mind. Okay, what else? Great nation. It's going to be a great nation, meaning he's going to have lots of descendants, lots of people. He's going to bless him, bless him. That sounds uh, very general, but it's very meaningful when it comes from God. What else? Make his name great. Make his name great. His name great. Now, this is important, and we're going to hold on to that phrase. We're going to use that again in a few minutes. Make his name great. This, this man from nowhere is going to have a great name. Are okay. they in the line of Jesus' birth? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. What else? He will be a blessing. He is going to bless others. He will, his people, his descendants will be a blessing to others. And if we're talking about the line that comes from him, Winona, how did his line end up being the greatest blessing in the whole world to others? Because he was part of Jesus. There's the biggest blessing in the whole world. Yes. Any others? Any other promises? That he would, God would bless those that blessed him and curse those that cursed him. Yes. And at the end of this, not only will you be a blessing, but to whom at the end of that verse 3? Also bless you. I mean, this is a widespread. Widespread. That's a lot a lot wrapped up in two verses. That's a lot of promises made from God to Abram. Wow, okay. Now to get some context as the Lord breaks through and gives Abram this, uh, this great uh, statement and all of these blessings, let's back up to Genesis chapter 11 and the first part of it and see how we got to this point, okay? Genesis 11 and the first nine verses are about the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel. Let's read these verses and let's see how well you remember um, this story. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As the people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves, Lida, so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. 
From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. There are several places here where we see the human plan versus the Lord's plan. And I want you to see the contrast here, how different these things are. The human plan versus the Lord's plan. The human plan, they say what? Come, let us do what? Build ourselves. Build Come, let us build a tower. Come, let us build a tower that reaches to the heavens. We're going to do it. Yes. Come, let us do that. But then in verse 7, you've got another come, let us. And this comes from the divine source. What was the Lord's plan? Confuse their language and scatter them. Confuse their language and scatter them. Use their language. The people say, let's get together and do this thing. The Lord said, let's get together and do this thing. And who is the us, I wonder, in verse 7? Trinity. You could read the Trinity into that and be right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. In, in heaven's theater, when we get to sit down and actually watch all these events, you know, in history, as I hope that we can, okay? It's not guaranteed, but I hope hope we get to see these the events theater. someday. The yes. Maybe, maybe, yes, on the Jumbotron. I would love to be able to see this, and especially that moment, that moment where all of a sudden Nobody can talk. they can't understand each other. That moment must have been precious. <laughs> it all breaks down. In a second. So what was the human plan in verse 4 regarding their glory? Lida, what was the human plan? To make a name for themselves. They want to make a name for themselves. We just read that in uh, the promise to Abram, remember? God's going to make Abram's name great. Here we have this idea, we're going to make a name for ourselves. People are still doing that. Oh my goodness, it seems like nearly everybody wants to be famous. Why? pride. They want to make a name. Why would God have a problem with this? Who's supposed to receive all the glory, all the credit, all the honor? So when they say we're going to make a name for ourselves, what if they are stealing from God? They're stealing from God. He's not going to share his book. He's not. He will not. Right. Never. Never, ever. Mm -mm. Nope. What was the Lord's plan regarding his glory back in Genesis 12 and 2? What was he going to do? To Abraham. He chose someone else to give a name to. He chose someone else to work through. The people don't get to make the decisions. God is going to guide history. Okay, what, what was the Lord's plan back in Genesis 9 and verse 7, regarding his, uh, what he was going to do with people. Genesis 9 and verse 7, God says to Noah, As for you, be fruitful and increase in number. Multiply on the earth and increase upon it. And then Genesis uh, 11, back in the Tower of Babel, end of verse 9. The Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. What was God's plan for people? Spread them out. Scatter them. He wanted them to disperse, fill the earth, subdue it. But what was the human plan here in chapter 11? What did they say? Verses 1 and 2, and then especially verse 4. End of verse 4. Make it a name for themselves again. Look at the end of verse 4, the very end. God wants to scatter them. What do they want to do? They want to stay in one place. They resist it. God had said to Noah, increase, spread out. The people all gather in one place, big lump. They want to make a name for themselves. And they say, we will resist scattering. We don't want to scatter. God says, you're going to scatter. They say, we don't want to scatter. Who's going to win this one? God. <laughs> 
So in these ideas here, the human plans, we're going to build. No, you're not going to. We're going to have glory. No, you're not going to. We're going to be stay still right here. No, we're, I'm going to scatter. What conclusions can we draw about our human plans versus the Lord's plan? They fall short. God's going to win. God's going to have his way. God's going to have his way. Even when the people are determined, even when the people are unified, if they are wrong and they are resisting his will, who is going to win? God is going to win. Surely that's got to apply to your life in some ways. Go out. Do you need to make a quick review of your life right now? Think about all your plans along the way and how those worked out, especially at those times, hold on, when they were contrary to God's will. Not really. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to <clears throat> step on your toes there. <laughs> well, and you know, even the great disbursement of once the Jewish people that did believe that was the Messiah didn't, wasn't that another, yet another? Disbursement going scattering because they all, a lot of them had to leave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and all along the way, God had His way with them. Yeah. We God, do, we sort of do the same thing because we like our fellowship and not necessarily bringing. Oh, resistant to evangelism, you're saying? Sometimes. Oh, okay. Us four and no more. <laughs> Holy huddle. Oh, okay. Okay. That, that feels like it could get real personal, Nancy. I wasn't talking about me. Oh, okay, 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 good. Other people have specks in their eyes. Yeah. Boy, we can see them clearly. God's plan. God's plan. This is important, okay, as we get into these, these men. And this, God's plan was to scatter people all over the earth and then build his people out of one family. Okay? His plan was to scatter them, and we see that from the time of Noah. But then he is going to choose and build his people out of one family. And this plan is going to continue from Genesis 12 all the way until the time of Christ. And then we see the family enlarged through the rest of the New Testament. Are you with me? This is the plan. This is the plan. Okay, let's talk about this family. I'm going to have to go backwards uh, again. What, um, what are the names of Noah's three sons? Do you remember this? He had three sons. Each one of them had wives. Do you remember? Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Yes, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. If you need to spell their names, Genesis 9 and verse 18. You're going to Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Three sons, and everybody then comes from these three sons. And years and years ago, we did a study on Noah, and we said each one of these sons and their families went different directions. And we even asked the question, who are we related to? Because Ham goes down to Africa, and Japheth ends up his family over towards Europe, and then Shem is right there in the Middle East. And we said, which son then are we related to? And we're going back uh, now seven or eight years, okay? Through these sons and where they go, we can trace basically all the lines of people who have uh, uh, propagated through the entire world. Yeah. yeah. So he's got these three sons. Through which son's line did Abraham come? Who is Abraham related to? Shem. Yes, Shem. And in Genesis 9 and verse 26... Noah says, praise be to the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. The God of Shem. This is going to be a special line. He recognizes, prophetic, that Shem is going to be the line that God blesses and builds his family through. The God of Shem. The God of Shem. In fact, in fact it's entirely possible you might have, a, you might have somewhere, let's see, uh, in my Bible, I remember seeing it that it even calls on one of the headings 
Yeah, right above uh, Genesis 10 and verse 21, it talks about the sons of Shem. And my Bible has a word above that. Does your Bible have a heading above uh, Genesis 10, 21? Nobody does? The Semites. The Semites. The sons of Shem are the Semites, from which we get the word anti-Semitic. Yes, it's against that line of people, the people who would become Jewish. Yes? Okay, so we've got the sons of Shem. Yes? You've got this. They are, they are the Semites. The Semites, from which we get uh, anti-Semitic. Back to Shem's line. Look over at uh, Genesis uh, chapter 11, and you can see in chapter 11 and verses 10 through 32, the account of Shem's family line. It lists all these names, a whole bunch of names, and how long they lived. Do you see that? Lots of strange names, lots of uh, numbers attached. There is a, a very particular person who becomes important in the story, mentioned in verses 14 through 17. Chapter 11, 14 through 17. When Shelah had lived 30 years, he became the father of Eber. And after he became the father of Eber, Shelah lived 403 years, had other sons and daughters. When Eber had lived 34 years, he became the father of Peleg. And after Peleg, Eber lived 430 years and had other sons and daughters. And it goes down and it ends in verse 26 with Terah. Terah, okay? Terah is the father of Abram. And Terah's family line you find in verses 27 through the end of the chapter. Eber. Eber is where, same root, we get Hebrew from. The Hebrews are because they are sons of Eber. We have Shem and the Semites, the god of Shem. We have Eber, the Hebrews, and this is how they are referred to throughout Genesis and Exodus. They are Hebrews. Hebrews, the sons of Eber, okay? So number five on your sheet, where does the name Hebrew come from? From Eber. Genesis 14 and verse 13, a man who had escaped came and reported this to Abram, the Hebrew. First time that word appears in the Bible. Genesis 14, 13, Hebrew. God's people, Shem, Eber. Then they take on the name of Abram's grandson, Jacob. And I've given you a, a, a chart down here, a genealogy of Shem. You see Shem? You see Eber? You go down to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob gets a name from God. What is the name that Jacob gets from God? Israel. 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 And after he gets that name, then the Hebrews are called Israelites. 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 You got it? So we're talking about different points in their family history. The sons of Shem, the sons of Eber, the Hebrews, and the sons of Jacob, the Israelites. And they are called Israelites throughout Exodus and all the way until the time of King Solomon. And Solomon, he dies, and something very important happens to the kingdom when he dies, the United Kingdom, what happens when Solomon dies? It splits. It splits. It splits because his son is a moron. And you've then got the northern tribes and the southern tribes. How many tribes in the northern tribes? Anybody? It's either two and two or two. <laughs> You're exactly right. Ten in the north, two in the south. The ten in the north are called the kingdom of Israel. The two in the south are called the kingdom of Judah. Judah and that includes Judah and Benjamin. But Judah's bigger. Judah. Israel and Judah. Okay? 722 BC. We're on the home stretch here. We're on the home stretch, I promise. Something happens. Assyria conquers the northern kingdom wipes them out, completely demolishes them, takes many to exile, and worse than that, brings in other foreigners from everywhere else to settle that area to basically breed these people out of existence. These 10 tribes never exist again, no matter what the Mormons say, okay? <laughs> these 10 tribes are gone. They are bred out of existence, 
And then in that area then, this kind of half-breed grows up where they've got a little Jewishness but a whole lot of other paganism. And then Jesus calls them, because they live in the region of Samaria, they are the Samaritans. Samaritans. Yes. But they are a very mixed up group of former, former Hebrews, Israelites. Okay? Southern Kingdom, Southern Kingdom, Judah... They, uh, their religion is they keep it and they continue to exist for a very, very long time. Judah, uh, Judahites, the sons of Judah, they practice Judaism. We then call them Jews. We call them Jews because they are from the southern kingdom of Judah. So on your sheet, the names of God's people in chronological order. Sons of Shem. Semites, sons of Eber, Hebrews, sons of Israel, Israelites, and then finally, sons of Judah, Jews. And that word Jews then sticks and it continues from the time of Ezra and Nehemiah all the way through to the New Testament, Jesus Christ hanging on the cross. They put the sign above his head, King of the Jews. Because this is his line. What's that? Shem's people are the Semites. Semites. So, you see there four names. We may use them interchangeably. You know, we don't we don't stop many times to consider who they are, how they come, whatever it is. But you can see they reflect different time periods in history and how this family grew and developed. That's a little background. This sets up Genesis chapter 12. Where we'll start next week, lesson one, as we get into the life of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. Isaac and Jacob. You know what I mean. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for our time together. We thank you for a, a trip back through your word, for a, a greater understanding uh, of how you have set things up as we see your plan and the great, uh, the great detail and the great pains that you took to make sure that things happened exactly as you intended. You are very deliberate in the way that you carry out your plan. And Father, we want to be submissive always to your will. Lord, we do not want to be found fighting against you, resisting the things that you would have for us or for your world, we want to come alongside. We want to be partners in your work. Lord, use us for your sake. In Jesus' name, amen.